Hello, this is Dr. Reginald Garman at Word of Faith Love Center. I pray that this message that you are about to hear will renew your mind, bless your soul, and inspire your spirit to love God through your living and to live God through your loving. I pray that you will share this message with someone else and be a blessing. And I hope to see you real soon at a live service right here at Word of Faith Love Center. The proof of desire is in the pursuit. You can desire something, but the proof of your desire is in your pursuit. That's why to say you want something and never pursue it, you deceive yourself. So we confirm the desires in our heart by what we pursue. You always know what is really in the desire of a person's heart by what they pursue. If they pursue money, they desire money. If they pursue relationships, they desire relationships. If they pursue power and fame, that's what's really at their heart's desire. But when they pursue God with all their hearts, their soul, and their strength, they know that they cannot live this life without him. Amen? Amen. Say that with me. The proof of desire is in my pursuit. Say it again. The proof of my desire is in my pursuit. So look at what you're pursuing. And don't deceive people when you let them know that you desire something, but they never see any effort or pursuit on your part. That means you want somebody to give you something. But life is not free. That is a cost that we pay, amen? So that's why we pursue God with all of our hearts, our mind, our soul, and our strength. If you will, turn in your Bibles today to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 6. We're going to be reading a very familiar verse in Mark chapter 6, starting with verse number 30. Mark chapter 6, verse 30. And let me say again that we are having um, service on Christmas at 10 o'clock, say 10 a.m., if you come at 11, we're going to be walking out the door at 11 o'clock, okay? Because it's a one-hour service, one hour. Say one hour. Pastor promised one hour. 11 o'clock, we're going to be walking out. I'm going to be saying the benediction at 11 o'clock, okay? So from 10 to 11, get up early, open up your gifts, come to church, then go home and feed your family, Amen. That's how the day is going to go on Christmas Day. And then watch night, we're having one service at 10 p.m. 10 p.m. on watch night as we bring this new year in. Amen. Here in Mark chapter 6, verse 30, a very familiar verse. If you've been in church any time in your life, you probably heard this text. It says, Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Ministry will wear you out. <laughs> Ministry will wear you out. There's nothing like that Sunday afternoon nap time for me. Can I get an amen in the house? I don't know what it is, but it seems like on Sunday I take the best naps. That Sunday afternoon, after you watch the Falcons, <laughs> and you have a little something to eat, I take the best naps on Sunday afternoon. It's something about when you have ministered that you pour out so much that you need to rest a while. It says, Jesus said, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. 
So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, speaking of Jesus, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They had a desire, didn't they? They had a desire. You see the pursuit? They ran there on foot from all the cities. You know you desire Jesus when you walk to go see him. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, he saw a great multitude. And good, look at this. He was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. He began to teach them many things. He began to what? Teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country, villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, look at what Jesus said. Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. Now, you can imagine how the disciples felt. They probably said, I'm hungry too. And he was like, you feed them. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when they had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. How in the world you feed 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This, this is a sign of goodness. This is Jesus. The Bible says Jesus went about doing good. This is one of those stories, one of those miracles about Jesus doing good. He saw the multitude, and first he saw that they were like a sheep without a shepherd. So the first thing he did, he taught them. He taught them, and after he taught them, he fed them. He met their spiritual needs before he met their natural needs. He met their spiritual needs first, and then he saw a natural need. We are both spiritual beings and we are natural beings. So when God calls us to do good with people, I think we should do good spiritually, but we should also do good naturally. I want you to pray for me spiritually, but then I want you to help me in the natural as well. I can receive the spiritual a little bit better when I know that you are there for me in the natural as well. But he taught them spiritually first, and then he said, listen, give them something to eat. And the disciples looked at him and said, how are we going to do that? You want us to go into town? And you want us to buy all this food for 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children? And Jesus said, you feed them. Go and count how many loaves you have. He said, we got five loaves and two fish. And then he prayed. He looked up to heaven and prayed, and God made a way. Say, God made a way. Tell your neighbor, say, God will make a way. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, in the New Living Translation, it says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Here was Jesus willing to give to this multitude. Whenever I see goodness, it, it always involves giving. It always involves giving, whether spiritually or naturally. You know, I talked about goodness last week, and God has called us to do good deeds, to do good works. It is amazing when, when you start doing good for others, good will come to you. When you start giving to others, then others will start giving to you. Amen? You know, it, it was amazing. It's, I love it when I teach something, and then God confirms it the week afterwards. So I started doing good. You know, we had an assignment to do a good deed or a good work, at least one thing every week. So I did my good deed. But guess what? I get a neighbor, a neighbor to come over my house and bring me a gift out of the blue. I'm outside trying to put up a little decorations outside. And it's dark. It's, you know, it get dark early now. I'm out there about 7 o'clock and I'm putting up, and I hear this voice, I almost turned around and did something. You don't sneak up on me like that at my house. But it was a neighbor that I'd been talking to, and he knew that I had a certain need. This neighbor took it upon himself to go out and buy something for me and bring it over to the house. First of all, I realized that the Holy Spirit had to talk to him for him to be in a store and think about me outside of my presence. There are people that are thinking about you and you don't have to be in their presence for them to think about you and they're going to bless you. Why? Because you have been doing good for other people and goodness will return back to you. So this neighbor came over my house and blessed me this week. I said, Lord, you know your word is true. Your word shall not return void. It shall not return void. But you cannot separate goodness with giving. But we have to understand a little something about giving. A little something about giving. And I use this text for us to understand a little something about giving. Before Jesus and the disciples gave to the multitude, guess what Jesus asked them to do? He asked them to go to a deserted place and rest. So the first thing that I want you to understand about giving is that you must prepare yourself to be a giver. Number one, you must prepare yourself to be a giver. Before you give, you must see about yourself because you cannot give what you don't have. You cannot give people joy when you don't have joy yourself. You cannot give people peace when you don't have peace yourself. So sometimes we have to get by ourselves in order so that we can be better givers for somebody else. I cannot help you until I help myself. I got to get rested, I got to get prepared, I got to get my mind right, I got to get my spirit right before I give, even before I come on Sunday. I got to get myself together before I'm able to pour out to somebody else. You have to see about yourself. And a lot of us are not givers because we have not seen about ourselves. You got to take care of yourself. The better you take care of yourself, the better you are able to take care of others. But if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't see about yourself, if you are not healthy spiritually, emotionally, and mentally, and financially, you're not going to be able to be a blessing to nobody else. Listen, you got to love others as you love yourself. Self. And sometimes you got to love yourself sometimes and don't apologize for taking time for yourself. Sometimes you got to get away and be like, I got to take care of me. I can't take care of you until I take care of me. Mamas, do y'all hear what I'm talking about? 
Because sometimes, mothers, you have to take care of yourself to take care of your baby. You just need a day. You just need a day where you can get it together so you can see about caregivers. Sometimes you just need one day so you can get it together so you can see about somebody else. You have to take care of yourself. When you find yourself giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and and you never give to yourself, you burn yourself out. In order for you to be givers, you got to see about you. Before there's an outpouring, there must be an infilling. You have to position yourself. You got to prepare yourself to be a giver. You must have the right attitude in order to give. If you always upset and mad at the world, how are you going to be a giver? How are you going to bless others? When you are tired, the only thing you can do when you're tired is rest. You can't give your effort to others when you're tired. And that's why Jesus said, wait a minute, y'all been out here pouring. Y'all been out here teaching, and y'all been doing all this stuff. He told his disciples, get to a deserted place and what? Rest. Rest. Because in a minute, y'all going to have to feed 5,000 folks. So you got to rest. Tell your neighbor, say rest. Say, it's okay to take care of you. Tell somebody, it's okay to take care of you. Now, people, people are going to want you to always be there for them. But they're not going to always be there for you. People want you to always take care of them, but they're not going to always. Come on now. So you got to find some time to take care of yourself or they will wear you out. And once they wear you out, they'll go to the next person. I get it. I get it. I understand it. Y'all love pastor, but if pastor wears himself out, y'all be like, we need a new pastor. I get it. I do get it. That's why I got to take care of myself, and I got to get away, and I got to rest, and I got to restore my mind and restore my body. I dare you to talk about how much I play golf. I'm taking care of myself when I'm out there on the golf course. I'm getting my mind right so I can pour out to somebody else. You got to take care of yourself. Baby, go have yourself a spa day. Go get your nails done. Go get your toes done. Go get your hair done. Just go do nothing sometimes. Don't call nobody. Don't send nobody no emails. Don't feed nobody. Send them a text. I sent my family a text today. I said, listen, y'all on your own for dinner today. I did. I ain't feeding nobody today. <laughs> Say prepare yourself. The more you prepare yourself spiritually and mentally, you become better givers. When you have, when you have unforgiveness in your heart, you don't give very well. So you got to go see about that unforgiveness in your heart because you lack giving because you got too much pain. You got too much stuff that you're dealing with. And you got to say, you know what? I got to get myself right. I can't give to you until I get myself right. I got to be whole. I got to be healthy so that I can be able to feed somebody else. You can't feed people when you are broken. You got to get healed. Say get healed. Number two, this is another thing about being a giver. Number two, love gives. Love gives. Love gives. Lust receives. Love gives. Lust receives. Lust will say, what have you done for me lately? That's lust. But love will say, what have I done for you lately? Lust receives, but love gives. If you're more concerned about receiving, you are lust-driven. But if you're more concerned about loving and giving, you are love-driven. Why does that matter? Because it matters what your motivation is for when you are a giver. Because if your motivation for giving is not right, you won't be consistent in your giving. 
Everything is about motive, is about motivation. The Bible says, look at verse 34. Mark chapter 6, verse 34. Look at verse 34. Look at what Jesus said, Mark chapter 6. He said, and Jesus, when he came out, he saw the great multitude, and he was moved with what? Say compassion. Compassion will produce a passion on the inside of you. Until you are moved with compassion, you cannot be passionate about anything. When you are compassionate about the plight of others, then you have a passion to help others. It was the compassion that was in Jesus' heart that moved him to give. We are not moved by wants. We are not moved by our feelings. And we are certainly not moved by manipulation. Sometimes people try to manipulate you to give. I can't get an amen in house. Sometimes people would try to set you up to give. Some people try to will and deal in order for you to give. If you do this, then I do that. No, I don't want to will and deal in order to give. If I want to give, I want to give out of my heart, not because we got some kind of contract and some kind of deal in place. No, I want to do it out of my heart because when I do it out of my heart, that means it is internal and not external. Because if I love you because of external motivation and manipulation, then I'm not going to love you for long because my love for you will remain as long as you do what you're supposed to do. But the moment you don't do what you're supposed to do, guess what happens to my love? Uh-uh, you don't deserve my love. Now you turn your love into a reward rather than a gift. So I ask you this question, is your love a reward or is your love a gift? God so loved the world that he what? Gave. It was a gift or was it a reward? It was a gift, right? None of y'all deserved it. The Bible says while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. So God's love for us was a gift, not a what? Reward. It was a what? Give, not a reward. You can always tell a gift from a reward when you find that your gift changes when the other person changes. But if your gift remained the same, you know how we used to do when we was little kids, when you give somebody something, then they act up and you go and what? You take it back and they call you what? You little Indian giver. I don't know where they got that from, the Indian giver. Is that what Indians do? What, what, what does that mean? You know, somebody explain that to me. You little Indian giver. You know, but, but you can tell that your giving was not motivated by compassion. It was not motivated by love because the moment they messed up, give me my ball back. Give me my toy back. And many of us, even though we're not little kids no more, we have that same attitude. Ooh, everybody look straight ahead. Everybody look straight ahead. So stop taking something that is meant to be a gift. Stop taking it back because love gives. Love gives. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. Look at this. Look at what the word of the Lord says. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Oh, God. So what John is saying, when you see that a brother has need and you have the world's goods and you shut up your bowels or shut up your heart from him, how can you say you have the love of God in you? If you have the love of God in you, you need to be given. If you are with somebody and you know they have a need and you have the means to meet that need and you ignore it, how in the world do you say you love that person? You up here shouting all day long, rolling all over the floor, speaking in tongues, but you got a person that has a need. 
and you got the power to meet that need. Where are your tongues then? I just want to know. Because you cannot say you love God just because you speak in tongues. He said you love God when you're able to see a brother or a sister in need and you don't shut up your heart from him. And the reason we shut up our hearts is because we haven't taken time for ourselves to get ourselves right. Our heart was closed even before we saw the need. And that's why you got to look after you and get yourself healed. Let me tell you this. You're not ready for relationships until you get healed. You don't have the ability to love yet. That's why you got to spend time with Jesus. You got to be like that woman at the well saying you done had some husbands. But there was something missing in that Samaritan woman. And he said, the one you're with is not your husband. But guess who you met today? I'm getting ready to fill that void in your heart. Whatever you've been looking for, baby, you're going to find it today at the well in a man called Jesus. This woman got changed. She got delivered to such a degree, she went and told the whole world, come see a man. She got healed. She got healed. So number one, prepare yourself to be a giver. Number two, love gives. Say love gives. Do you love or are you in lust? Do you love or are you in lust? Number three, giving is your personal responsibility. It is your personal responsibility. That's why Jesus told the disciple, he said, you give them something to eat. He said, that's your responsibility. You give them something to eat. The disciples like, they wanted Jesus to do everything. Uh, uh. He said, no, you give them something to eat. There are some things that are your responsibilities to do. It is your responsibility. Say, it's my responsibility. It's my responsibility to raise my children. It's my responsibility. I can't put that off on the church. I can't put that off on the schools. It is my responsibility to raise my children, to love my children. That's my responsibility. This is my responsibility to be able to speak the word of God to this house that's in this place. This is my responsibility. Take care of my responsibilities. You have to own up your responsibilities because God will ask you to give something you think you are unable to give. God will always ask you to give something you're unable to give. That's why Jesus told the disciples, you give them something to eat. The disciples are looking at, what do we have? All I got is annihilated in my pocket. How many of y'all remember annihilators? See, you're showing your age now. If y'all don't know what I just said, you're too young. But he told them, you do it. God will always ask you to do something you think you're unable to do. Tell your neighbor, say, you're able. You're able because giving is a function of your heart, not your hand. Listen, giving is a function of your heart, not your hand. Write that down. Giving is a function of your heart, not your hand. If it's in your heart to give, God will make a way. If it's in your heart to give, God will make a way. I've always had a desire to just bless people and employ people and just be able to give people an opportunity. Guess what? I'm doing that now. Because it was always in my heart, even though it wasn't in my hand. I wanted to make a way to be able to be a blessing to others. Because I had a righteous prayer. I had an unselfish prayer. I didn't want it just for me. I wanted a means to be able to be a blessing to somebody else. That's why I give away so much stuff. And I don't charge what I should be charging. Because greed is not my motivation. My motivation is to be a blessing to other people. When God puts it on your heart, he'll put it in your hand. As long as it's in your heart, if you had the motive 
before you have the means. You will have the motive before you have the means. Your motive is to be a blessing. Your motive is to provide for others. God will give you the means to do it. If you want your business just to make you rich, that's the wrong motive. But if you want a business so you can employ other people and help other people, God will give you the means. Giving is a personal responsibility. Don't pass it on to nobody else. You got to ask yourself, what kind of prayers are you praying? Do you want five loaves and two fish to feed yourself, or do you want five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 people? So when you want it to feed 5,000 people, God will take the little bit you have, and he'll say, I'll multiply, because your dream is always bigger than your present circumstance. Oh, God, if your dream is not bigger than where you are right now, your dream is too small, and baby, you need to start dreaming a bigger dream. Your dream will always be bigger than your means. Dream bigger dreams. And when you dream bigger dreams, God will give you bigger responsibilities. And when God gives you bigger responsibilities, God will give you bigger provisions. Bigger provisions. Giving is a personal responsibility. Now, look at what he said in verse 39 and 40. Look at verse 39 and 40 of um, Mark chapter 6, verse, um, verse 39. He said, then he commanded them, speaking of who? The disciples. He commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass, verse 40. So they sat down in ranks of hundreds and in fifties. Now, here's a powerful principle. Number four, before you give, get things in order. Before you give, get things in order. Before you give, get things in order. Be very careful, people, giving to disorder. You don't give to this. Look at what Jesus did. Now, this is scripture, right? Jesus said, before I feed y'all jokers, I'm not giving to chaos. Y'all better sit down. (laughs) Can y'all see Jesus saying that? Y'all, don't rush up here. (laughs) Sit down. In groups of 150, and then we're going to feed y'all. If y'all don't sit down somewhere, ain't feeding y'all, y'all not going to be rushing up here at Jesus. Be careful, very careful giving to disorder, because when you give to disorder, it is not a blessing, it's a curse. Because when you give to people that don't have their life in order, they will lose the blessing. They will lose the blessing because their life is not in order. So you give to them, you casting your pearls among the swine, and they're simply going to waste. Now, I believe God will still bless you because your heart was right. But you got to make sure that you don't put people in a position where they are not being blessed themselves. This is why sometimes I have to teach people before I give to people. That's why Jesus taught them before he fed them. And if you don't teach somebody before you feed them, then you'll feed them something they're not ready for. Woo! Because many of y'all are not ready to be a millionaire. Because if I gave you a million dollars right now, do it, Jesus. Y'all saying that. Y'all saying that. Do it, Jesus. (laughs) Do it, Jesus. Pastor, just give me a million. I'll show you I'm ready for it. But what I'm saying is don't feed disorder. Because when you feed disorder, you perpetuate disorder. If you feed something that's not in order, then it's not going to bring a 
return on your investment. It's not going to help you or help them when you feed disorder. So before you feed somebody, make sure their life is in order. They got to at least set the table before you feed them. Put it in order. Put some things in order. Put your life in order. I'm not going to feed something that's out of order because you're going to lose it. When something is out of order, it will require more than what is needed. When something is out of order, it will require more than is needed. That's why when I see people that need money, you need more than money. You need some financial training. You need to know how to manage your money. Because if you don't learn how to manage your money, why would I feed you? If I feed you with a husband and you don't know how to treat a husband, why would I feed you with a husband and you don't know how to treat a husband? Why would I feed you with a wife and you don't know how to treat a woman? Why would I feed you with something and your life is out of order? I'm making you perpetuate that disorder because the worst thing you can do is get blessed in your disorder because you deceive yourself thinking you got it all together. You understand? So sometimes you need someone that loves you and say, listen, God wants to bless you with this, but you can't handle the blessing right now. Once you get some things in line, get rid of the disorder in your life and watch and see God open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Sometimes when you're praying to God for a healing, maybe there's some things in your diet that's out of order. Oh, God. Oh, y'all mighty quiet on me now. So why would God heal you and you still eating that fatty, salty stuff? Y'all don't want to hear this. Order must precede giving. And God is telling some of us, if not all of us, Sit down, get some stuff in order, and then I'll pour out the blessing. If your garage is nasty, why would you pray to God for a new car? Tell your neighbor, say, clean your garage out first. (laughs) If God gave you a new car, you wouldn't have nowhere to put it. Sometimes, you know, nah, I ain't going to share that. <clears throat> Woo, I'm about to get in trouble. Number five, multiplication happens because there is a demand. Multiplication happens. Help me out, Marcus. I'm, I'm done. Multiplication happens when there's a demand. Hunger puts a demand on what is your, in your hand. Hunger puts a demand on what's in your hand. The only reason Jesus did this miracle is because there was a hunger that put a demand on Jesus. Hunger puts the demand on God. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. The one thing you can do is go to God and let them know about the hunger that's in your heart. And do you realize, I think that's why God puts hungry people around you. Because when hungry people are around you, it puts a demand on the anointing that's in your life. It puts a demand. And let me say this. The people that are hungry are not necessarily the people that are broke. It's the people that are broken. And you wonder why God brings broken people around you. Because there's something in your life that God wants you to feed them with. And because you have been there and done that, and you've been healed from that, you are pouring not from a broken pitcher, 
but you're pouring from a pitcher that has been broken, that's been healed, and that's been filled, and now you're ready to pour into somebody else. And so when you see hungry people and broken people come around you, you should ask God, Lord, what is it in me that they need? What is it that's in my life, oh God, that I need to pour into them? Because their hunger should be putting a demand on your life. And if you ever move with compassion, you cannot help them. You will be moved to help them because you realize somebody helped you. Somebody was there for you. Somebody gave you an encouraging word when you needed it. So the compassion that's in your heart, this was not a compassion that you read about. This was a compassion that you needed yourself. The real compassionate people are those that have been through something. Because nothing makes you compassionate more than your own struggles. That's why the Bible said Jesus was touched with the infirmities of his people. And even though he was never broke, he was never sick, he was never lost, he was still able to have compassion. So God brings broken people around you so that you can feed them, so you can give to them. So you can get that life in order because you got to feed them spiritually and naturally. Don't feed them naturally and you haven't fed them spiritually because it's the spiritual feeding that's going to get their life in order. Ooh, y'all better preach to me today. And I can't give to something that's out of order. So God brought these hungry people to Jesus. And Jesus said, sit down. Get your life in order. Because I'm getting ready to pour out into you. And the last thing I want to say to you, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 7. This is it. I'm gone. We done. We done. I'm finished. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 7 in the New Living. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. <laughs> oh, Jesus. The person that has the power to give a blessing. Because the 5,000, all they got was a fish sandwich. But the Bible says, they had 12 baskets left over. So when you give somebody a sandwich, God will give you a basket. And some of y'all have been giving sandwiches out to people and God said, I got a basket waiting for you because it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. The feeders are always more blessed than the fed. And God wants to bless some feeders today. If you know you've been a feeder, I want you to stand to your feet. God's got a basket full of blessings in your life. Hallelujah. 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 Without question, the person who has the power to give is greater than the one who is blessed. I want to talk to some feeders today. And I'm not talking about just feeding somebody a fish sandwich or money. I'm talking about you saw a broken soul. And if you just gave them a prayer, or an encouraging word. You're a feeder today. 
your feeder today. And God has allowed your life to be a living testimony to somebody else. And I want you to declare to you today that God's got a blessing for you. It's better than a Christmas gift. It is a blessing from heaven. Say, Father, I receive it today. I receive it today. Father, bless these feeders today, God. Bless them, oh Father. They have blessed others. I pray that you will pour into their life as they have fed others, oh God, as they have been compassionate in others, God. I pray that you will feed them, oh God, that you will bless them, bless their bodies, bless their minds, bless their souls, bless their families, God, bless their finances. Bless, oh God, everything they put their hands to do. Bless it, oh God. May it prosper, Lord God. You know, God, what they have need of. And these are feeders today, God, those that have fed someone a word or a prayer. God, I pray that you will bring revelation knowledge back to them. And those that have poured out, may you pour back into them. Help restore them, oh God, even when they have poured out to others. May you open up the windows of heaven and pour them out a blessing that they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Clap your hands and thank God for his blessings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take your seats just for one second. If you're in this place and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you know him, but you've messed up, you made some mistakes, and while every head is bowed and every eye is closed at this moment, we want you to be restored before you leave today. If you've done some things that you're not proud of, that's between you and God. I'm just here to pray with you and pray for you. And this is a time that you can get it right. If you confess your sins, the Bible says that he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. This is what it's all about. It's about restoration. Restoration, maybe you've been broken, and maybe sin has broken you, or bad decisions has broken you. I want you to be made whole today by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is by the blood that we are restored, that we have been justified. Nobody else, it's not by works, but it's by grace. It's by grace. And I just want you to confess today, if you just lift up your hands and say, Pastor, I need prayer today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I see your hands. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being honest with God. In the balcony, I see your hand. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Raising of your hand is the act of your confession today. Thank you, thank you for being honest with God. You can put your hands down. Everybody say this prayer with me. Dear Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I declare that he is Lord of my life, and by his blood I have been saved. I pray, God, that you help me to live a life that's pleasing to you. And Lord, thank you for forgiving me today and releasing me from the bondage of sin. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Stand to your feet, everybody. So glad to see you in the house of the Lord today. Were you blessed by the word today? Amen. Amen. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. When you see people around you, broken people around you, pour into them. Pour into them. Pour your anointing into them. They need it. They need it spiritually and naturally. Be a blessing to somebody else. Lord, as we leave this place today, I pray, God, that you will order our steps, that you will guide our thoughts, that you will fill us with your presence. I pray, God, that your favor will surround us like a shield and that, God, you, O oh Father, will be glorified in everything that we do. Thank you, Father, for speaking to our hearts today. Thank you for your presence today. Thank you for allowing us to be instruments and ambassadors for you. Now, God, I pray for each and every home that's represented today that you will bless their home 
with peace, with joy, with health, with prosperity, and more than anything, bless their homes with your presence. Now, God, may your spirit rest, rule, and abide with us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Y'all have an awesome week. I love you. I'll see you next week.